I've been very fortunate that I've been in sustainable energy for, well, coming up 35 years this year. And you probably guessed from the colour of the hair, I've certainly been around a long time. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you about something which I really passionately believe in. So if I try and share my skin and keep my fingers crossed in this one. Okay, well, uh, one of the great things I've done since I've been retired a couple of years now, and one of the great things I've done is get into community energy. And uh, that's a shot in 2013 of the opening of the solar park up at West Mill. And I'm a member of that and many others. And I'm also, been until recently, I was chair of the West Mill Wind Farm. And that is the typical corporate members. And quite clearly, they are a bunch of eco-terrorists. But there we are, that's life. Now, sorry, I should have said, there's three things I want to talk about tonight. We're going to a low carbon world, despite what Donald Trump might be trying to do. Keeping the lights on is a big political aspect that people want to see. And we need to do this affordably. And that's the three things I want to get over tonight. And the reason it's going to happen very naturally is I've compared here, where did we get our electricity from in 2008 and last year? And this is a hot off the press data. And I used 2008 because that was when the West Mill wind farm started. And look at what's happened to coal. There was some 300 terawatt hours generated last year. Seven out of the 300 of those came from coal. Natural gas went down. Nuclear's made much the sort of same. But look at the growth in renewables. Nearly a six-fold growth in the last 11 years. Most encouraging. Now, in total, not clear from the data, but if you can do the sums later, in 2008, we used 369 terawatt hours. We needed that much generation to supply the electricity that we all need for home, business, etc., etc. But in 2019, there was only 324 uh, terawatt hours provided. And that means that, uh, sorry, I should have said at the beginning, a billion kilowatt hours is what a terawatt hours. It's big, it's big. It's a billion kilowatt hours. So it went down by 12%. And this is a point I'm going to keep coming back to. Because people used to say, oh, you cannot actually improve the, the living standards and the GDP of the country unless we use more and more energy. Well, that, those days are long gone. And again, this is part of the important thing. Now, you'll notice that the, if you include nuclear, and I would do as a, a non-carbon dioxide producing thing, we're getting close to having 50% coming from it. So we are, you know, and this year already we're way over 50% of electricity is coming from mainly renewables because nuclear actually is not doing too well at the moment. Two of the PWRs have been off for, uh, sorry, two of the AGRs have been off for a long time at Hunterson B and Dungeness. In fact, it's interesting for another thing I've been working on. In 1987, we produced 56 terawatt hours. And 2019, all that time afterwards, it's still 56 terawatt hours. So we managed very well without nuclear growth. Remember, we we're all supposed to be building literally tens of post-pressurized water reactors after size. Well, well, it's never happened. And I'm hoping there won't be any more after the Hinkley point. And I will show you in a minute why we can't afford any more. So what I want to do is go, oh, listen, I've got people in the waiting room. I can't do anything about that, can I? Or should I? Um, just 
John, do you want to... Should John, I... are you there? Where's Could John? Uh, hang on. Um, could you let them in, Ian? I'm sorry, it's a bit of a pain, but um, if yeah, you just... Yeah, I've done it. I've done it. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to go back to basics. What is the problem? Why does it occur? And how often does it occur? I want to talk about the political pressure and current UK so-called solutions. I want to talk about the global experience of solving it smartly. And I want to talk about some technology solutions for the future. I want to talk about energy efficiency, including minimum performance standards for appliances, lighting, etc. And I want to talk also about uh, remotely shifting non-critical electric loads. Grid interconnection, something that might not be familiar to you, between European countries, how important that has been to lowering costs, you'll see in a minute, and actually doing things. And then, of course, battery storage. But my particular hobby horse is linked to electrical, the electric vehicle development. So let's get going on this. Oh, yes, I should have said interconnection means basically physical electricity carrying wires under the sea, which come from Europe, Ireland, into the UK. So, now that I've done all that, ah, there we go. Ah, back to basics. Okay, first of all, I'm going to change units again, so apologies for that, but it makes sense. A gigawatt, one GW, is a million kilowatts. And the whole point about electricity demand, it has always varied throughout time. Typically two and a half to three times to one between the lowest amount of electricity being demanded and the highest. So for example, I can't get data for 2019 yet, but for 2018, the peak demand was 50 gigawatts. So 50 million kilowatts. The average was 33 and the minimum was 19. Now in Britain, peak demands are still between five and seven on weekday winter evenings, or when there's a major disruption in generation. Snow brings down the, the wires, storms, unexpected failure. And when that happens, the speed of response is critical. Now the peak hours get high prices. I mean, at home, you're probably paying 15, 16 pence a kilowatt hour. But at the high prices then are in the pounds. But there's not many hours of them. There's less than 100 hours a year when those prices get that high. So currently, it's not worth in the UK trying to store renewable electricity to get the peak electricity price. There's less than 100 hours in the year. And a year as every school child knows, contains 8,760 hours. What's the plan? What's the government's intentions today? Well, in the Energy Act in 2013, they introduced a capacity market because they were worried about they would have enough capacity to keep the lights on. Now, that meant ensuring the security of supply at the least cost to the consumer. And the whole point was to encourage new generation to enter the market. Now the second part was a contracts for difference. And this was replacing the old renewable obligation certificates and ultimately the feed-in tariffs. And the whole idea was to provide stable long-term revenue for new low carbon initiatives. Great. In other words, if you're going to be a renewable developer, you know what price you're going to get over the, the period that your investment will last. Now, the contract for difference guarantees a fixed income for a set period of years to the electricity generator, irrespective of the wholesale price of electricity. 
So that's what you get on the market. And that varies, obviously, but it gives you a guarantee. So if the wholesale price is greater than the CFD, in some way gets the CFD price, which is fair for consumers. And I'll come back and explain you a bit more about why this is not necessarily happening. Now, the first capacity market auctions were, frankly, in my absolutely abysmal. The government were warned that you had to make sure you reward the generators capable of rapid response in an emergency. But guess what? No, none of that. No, no. So coal stations were being supported. Coal stations are notoriously inflexible. Once they're running, they're going well, but they can't go up and down quickly. They said, all right, we'll let the demand side measures, in other words, measures to reduce or shift the peak demands, give them one year contracts. Whereas all the new build, and you'll see one got a lot more than 15 years in a minute, but they got 15 years for new build. It cost you, me, and other end users one billion pounds and it awarded 94.3% of that money to the existing generators. Now the fast acting flexibility that National Grid needs when they have problems encourage lots of new small scale diesel generators. Diesel generators are very high CO2 emitters. Just about the last thing we wanted to try and do, but unfortunately that's what happened. Even by February 2018, the auction was still dominated by the existing generation. 86% of the capacity was awarded to existing generation. And they included, by this time, nuclear. The nuclear got 16% of that. New build generation was 1.5%. 1.5, remember the objective? 1.5%. What saved us was this was the first time grid interconnectors, that's these wires coming from all around, participated. And they took only 9% and new battery storage took 0.3%. However, because the interconnectors were in, there were much lower clearing prices and the cost to electricity end users was halved. For the 2019-20 auction, they finally, finally put in something that made you actually have to be fast responding in order to really qualify. And the existing generation was down to 48% and new generation was 18%. In terms of technology, technology, 56% was combined cycle gas turbines, 28% was the wires under the sea, generation when wastes was 7%, Demand side response, shifting the loads around, was 5%. But all the others, including battery storage, was 3%. So really, an improvement, but my goodness, that's now taken us six years to get here. The clearing price was the lowest ever, again, because of all the other things coming in. And it was seven times lower, times lower than the last two comparable auctions. That saved us a lot of money. Sorry, I'm going to have to go and do my admit roll. Uh, so I'm now on to the UK's. Sorry, I've gone backwards, I think. No. Sorry, this is. This is not working. Every time I go up there, I'm afraid it goes wrong. Okay, compact. so the contracts for differences. Initially, the government negotiated directly with the nuclear industry and the early offshore wind farms. Now, if you think about it, the nuclear and the wind people, they spend their lives worrying about this they know their costs inside out. There is, to say the least, an asymmetric knowledge difference between government and the industries. And I'm glad to say that they finally quickly realized this. And since 2015, it's become an auction. And the auction has been held 
and the guaranteed income price, the contract for difference, was given to the lower bidders. Now this is known as a strike price and it's usually priced in pence per kilowatt hours. At least these are figures we'll recognize. <laughs> now early auctions were oversubscribed and highly variable in price. The quota was decided by the government, but the key point is that all successful bidders get that strike price. Now, to make the comparisons very easy, the government keeps all the guaranteed CFD prices in 2012 money. Now, that's for presentation. Every price is inflated with the, comp the consumer price index, but at least it makes my job easy of showing you this. And I apologize for this complex slide. So let me start at the bottom. All strike prices are in 2012 money. And if we take what was struck, the special deal was for Hinkley Point C. And the strike price was 9.25 pence per kilowatt hour. And it was awarded for 35 years. Now, if we look at the price of wholesale electricity, and this is the red prices here, these prices are in the, the year that, so 2012, it was five and a half pence per kilowatt hour. Today's price is, point, is four and a half pence per kilowatt hour. So the Hinkley Point C was twice as expensive for 35 years, and you and I are gonna to have to pay for that. So if we look at what the CPI inflation has done, that 9.25 is now, 10.4 pence per kilowatt hour. And so it's going to go on for 35 years at more than twice today's wholesale electricity price. And it won't be built 25, 26, so sometime yet before it comes on. So remember that 9.25, because all these numbers are in 2012 money. The PV solar auction, the first auction, got the strike price down to 6.7 pence. Now remember with a strike price, you don't get any subsidies. The contract difference is between the 6.7 and the four and a half. They only got 15 years. We all think both wind and PV will last longer. The lowest was actually five pence per kilowatt hour, but it still got the 6.7. But there wasn't very much in terms of million kilowatts involved. The onshore wind in the first auction they had, by Jove, that had come down a bit, 8.2. The offshore ones were way very expensive early ones, but they'd come down to 8.2 pence per kilowatt hour for 15 years. On to 15 offshore wind, uh, sorry, that was onshore. Offshore was 12 pence per kilowatt hour and 15 years. By the time we got to offshore wind in 2017, it's down to 6.4. And now the last one, the offshore wind in 29 auction was 3.97 pence per kilowatt hour. In other words, it's under the wholesale electricity price. And the lovely example of the remote island wind is Sorry, I keep having to change things. I admit people. Okay, um, the remote island wind in Scotland was four pence per kilowatt hour, but that's because they're very windy. But I think that tells you that if we do onshore wind down in uh, lots of the rest of the, the country, it will be able to compete very well with the uh, current wholesale prices. So it's a complicated slide, but I think you're getting the message. Knowing what the compact, the contract for difference price should be was a bit of a mess in the beginning. We probably overpaid for both the nuclear and the early offshore winds, but it has helped the offshore wind now, and it's just happening the world over now. So all encouraging stuff. However, 
as I keep pointing out, we're in the 21st century. So why do we keep harking back to big engineering solutions from the last century? And let's just look around and think, well, other countries must be suffering. Denmark, suffering? No. 50% of the electricity demand is from wind and solar. 47% of their electricity comes from wind and the other 3% comes from solar. And why have they not had blackouts? Why have they not had any problems? Simply because of the good interconnection grid links with the Nord Pool, which is basically the Scandinavian trading system for electricity. The largest electricity market in the world is the Pennsylvania, Jersey, New Jersey and Maryland. It's 14 uh, northeast states in the US, largest in the world, and it uses hot water storage and demand response very successfully. And I'll show you some of that. But this is the thing I really feel. IT has become so cheap now. And soon we will have smart meters. Ha ha ha, what a farce that's been. But anyway, we will soon have smart meters capable of two-way communication and time of use control. And again, I can show you why that is going to make such a difference. And the key technology areas for us to go to low carbon world in a controlled, safe, no problems with keeping the lights on fashion and affordably were identified in the European Climate Foundation's roadmap to 2050. And their energy efficiency, including minimum performance specification and demand side response, interconnection between neighboring countries, and battery storage where other grid benefits can happen. I'll go into some examples of this. Frequency response, avoiding the distribution grid reinforcement, etc., etc. So battery storage is still quite expensive, really, for most things, but there are developments that are always underway, but it's, it needs other benefits from the grid or the distribution system to make it stack up in the current market. I can't see. No. Nope. I'm apologize for jumping around like this, but I, I, I normally would use it just a down arrow, but the down arrows don't seem to work for whatever reason. So energy efficiency, the first one. Um, what I want to talk about is Despite the increased use of information, communication, and entertainment devices in the average household, the electricity consumption has been dropping since 2005. If I tell you that in a gas centrally heated house, more than 70% of electricity is for lights and appliances, the rest are obviously some sort of cooking, etc. So it's quite amazing just how much that has dominated from what it was a few years. Now, the reason it's drawn from four and a half thousand kilowatt hours a year in 2005 to 3,700 kilowatts now is because of minimum improved appliances, etc. Now, gas reduction has been even more dramatic. In 2004, the peak was 16,000. It's now down 8, 000, sorry, 4,000 kilowatt hours in, in the household. Now, why has that happened? More efficient lighting. We had compact fluorescent light bulbs. People didn't like them, but light emitting diodes, people have taken to greatly, and they are using so much less electricity. It's brilliant. Appliances. We have labeling of appliances. We have minimum energy performance standards. And cooking, we're moving now to induction hobs, no longer these big chunky uh, hobs that took forever to warm up. Heating and hot water has improved insulation, cavity walls have been filled, boilers have been made to be efficient, 90% efficient. All of these reduce demand. The other thing that's been happening, and again, you won't have noticed this, 
but they have reduced standby consumption. Now, what do I mean by standby consumption? Well, that is basically when something is on, not on rather, doing its function, but it's actually using electricity. So your television on standby. And the early gaming stations were 20 watts when not on in standby, 20 watts. Now that doesn't sound a lot really, but if you remember there are 8,760 hours in a, a year, then that will cost about 20 quid a year, just on that, even today. Now the International Energy Agency had a campaign to reduce this to one watt. And after being told by various industries that it couldn't be done, it was done. And now we're moving to a half watt. So we're going to kill for once and for all the, uh, the energy efficient uh, wastage through um, this. Energy efficiency is also benefit greatly from the eco-design process. The EU EcoSign has reduced energy demand by setting minimum energy performances and standby standards. Household lighting, appliances, industrial motors and drives, office equipment. Now as all these things operate during the peak hours, it actually reduces demand. But the other way of doing this is to use, oh yes, I'll give, give you an example. Um, the, the, no, I'll, I'll, I'll keep that later. So I'll just skip to where I'm going. As operate during the peak hours, then you're going to reduce demand. And demand response is the shifting of the time of the energy service. Now this is happening already in the service sector, but in the residential sector, it will need aggregators. In other words, people will gather to people, uh, gather to the households with similar energy demands and say, look, why don't we do things like they all charge our cars at night or whatever. But in turn, they need longer than one year contracts. You'll remember this nonsense that they could only have one year contracts. Now an obvious residential end service is to shift includes freezers and the growing use of plug-in electric vehicles. If you remember, the freezer actually is only on 15% of the time in the year, unless you go in and out like you know, tomorrow. So, for the other 85%, it does nothing. And so you can, you're using smart meters, you could charge up freezers to get quite chilly and then not come on during peak hours unless you had a, obviously you're worried about your food. But by shifting the load away from the peaks, it's dead easy. And this can all be done once we get aggregators and smart meters in homes. PGM. This is the 14 Northeast US states, the largest regional transmission organization in the world. It operates a competitive wholesale electricity market and manages the high voltage electricity grid. It's an independent system operator. Now this is wonderful text before the US DOE electricity, that's the US Department of Energy Electricity Advisory Committee. Now the CEO was a typical engineer building nuclear and pumped hydro plants, but he's been a convert. And at the Committee on Energy Efficiency, he waxed incredibly lyrical about how he could shift load using hot water in offices and commercial properties and coupled with rapid communication from the electricity grid. So, there's his 105 gallon, <laughs> it's probably an American gallon, so it's probably not as big as that. Uh, and it's got 4.5 kilowatt power, and in there is stored 26 kilowatt hours. And I'm, this is a quote, I know how to spell favorite. He said, my favorite of all is the water heaters. That's a picture of our water heater in our lobby. The point is 50 milliseconds after we ask to do it, it does it. And the pay for performance is coming out way with the, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's regulations. In other words, what they, 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 if they get good performance, they can get uh, 
they get money, the company gets money. So it's a good device. If we took the 53 million connected water heaters to PGM, converted them to storage as France has done because of their nuclear fleet, 70% of the water heating is done at night in France. So he, he, he's a great believer now, and it's such a simple thing. Every commercial office, every restaurant, every pub has water storage. And it's shifting load. It's a no-brainer, and no one needs to get involved. It can all be done remotely. So this is what we hope is the way it's going to go. Now let me talk about UK electricity interconnections. These are rapidly changing. There was only one interconnector before 2001. Now all of them come across as DC current for two reasons. Firstly, because by coming across as DC, they do not incur high induction losses is for what you happen if you use alternating current, which we have at home. The other reason is to make sure that the frequency it's coming across would match the frequency that we need in this country. So these are giant, if you like, these are giant batteries. Now, in existing at the moment, we have four and a half million kilowatts of capacity. France, two gigawatts. Netherlands one, Ireland a half, Belgium one. Under construction and operational by the end of this year is another 2.4 gigawatts. And in planning, there are more going to be countries above between 2022 and 23, plus Denmark, Germany. We're talking 5.7 gigawatt capacity. So all in all, by 2023, long before Sizewell's operating, we could have 12 gigawatts of capacity. Sizewell, by the way, is about uh, 2.83, uh, 3, 3, 3 gigawatts. Now that is quite substantial. Remember, the peak is 50 gigawatts and the average is 33 gigawatts of demand. Now, of course, not all planning may be built because, well, Brexit, obviously, but it will be in competition with new generation and will depend on the UK and the EU CO2 tax differences and member state subsidies because member states, I know they shouldn't be, but they are all subsidizing in clever ways their electricity industries. Battery storage. Now there is planning consent for 4.8 gigawatts planning consent, but we're nowhere near that in terms of actually operational. There are many operational and demonstrations going on, and in total, they have about 1,000 megawatts of capacity, or one gigawatt of capacity. National Grid couples the storage with enhanced frequent control. Now this is important to know. Uh, basically, that's one of the ways they, 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 they control the, the grid, help balance the grid in less than a second. They can change the frequency. It's normally 50 cycles a second, the AC that comes into our homes, but with uh, they have the power to change that between 49.5 and 50.5, as long as they get it right over the day. But they can do that. And so they use that storage because batteries are very fast and so a great chance to use enhanced frequency control. UK Networks Power in Leighton Buzzard has got a six megawatt hour, that's how much energy is in that, 6,000 kilowatt hours are stored in that, lithium ion battery. And that was because it actually meant they, had, they could avoid putting in a new distribution network. There's 50 megawatts in Yorkshire, which is, gives control, has, will hold 75,000 kilowatt hours using national grid funding from frequency response, services, and the capacity market. Though the capacity market, as you've seen, is just disappearing now. It's no longer being used for these things. 
So given the current costs, batteries need other income to store renewable energy to release at peak demand times. Now, clearly, electric vehicles are expanding rapidly and the car owner pays the cost of the batteries. But there are no incentives for us car owners to charge or discharge work according to the network needs. And with smart meters, this can all be done quite simply. Now, transport, along with replacing gas central heating, is the biggest two challenges we're facing. And transport are almost unanimously decided they're going to go down the electricity because it's got all the infrastructure we need and car manufacturers are therefore putting a lot of effort into hybrid and electric cars and the performance is improving each year. Now they need to continue to dive down the battery costs and improve the performance so they can sell the cars. So I think we should let them take the lead in that and wait till they get the prices just right and then we should jump in in a big way and that's the way to get storage going. And that is the end. I'm sorry again for the chaos of the early or the delayed start and for the, the very inappropriate handling of my mouse which meant I couldn't slow, show the slides in the way I wished. Thank you again.